Hey everybody, welcome to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your girl Jessie Mae Peluso and I have a crick in my neck. How you feeling? I'm excited for this episode. It's a Dr. P episode. If you would like to submit questions to Dr. P, you can do that by visiting my Instagram story, Sundays and Mondays, not every single week, but keep checking in and you can DM me a question or you can put it right on that Instagram slide with Dr. P on it, or you can email us at jessiemaypelusocomedy at gmail.com and we would so happily oblige to your question. We are here for you. I will say, not a real doctor. I do not have a PhD from any college. I do have a PhD in THC. I went to the school of life. I got my education in the streets and in the sheets. So that's where this is all coming from. I am not a real doctor. I am in no way a replacement for your medical doctor history advice that you're getting from a medical professional. This is all for fun. All the advice I'm giving you comes from my life experiences and books that I've read, podcasts I've listened to, and various content that I have absorbed. Basically, my own research and existence gives you this Dr. Peluso episode, and we appreciate you so much. Also, if you want to see me live, you have multiple ways to do that before the end of the year. This weekend, I'm going to be in some fucking town in Pennsylvania with Carly Aquilino at Soul Joel's. It was one town, now it's another town. I think it's Pottsville or Potts Grove. I don't know. There's pots involved. Hopefully, there is pot involved. Uh, I will also be in Arizona the first week of November, 3rd through the 5th. I will be in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 11th and 12th with Carly Aquilino. Also, I'll be in Chicago with Carly, November 18th and 19th at the Zanies. Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We're going to be in Cisco at the Cisco Brewery. Brewery. And the last weekend of November, the 25th and 26th, we just added Albany Funny Bone. So come check that out. A lot of upstate dates. December 16th and 17th, I'm going to be at the Comedy on the Carlson in Rochester, New York. And rounding up this year, I'm going to be celebrating my new annual show, At the Funny Bone in Syracuse, New York for New Year's Eve, you will have four opportunities to see me live. Come check it out at the Syracuse Funny Bone. That's December 30th and 31st. Ring in the new year with your favorite girl, Jessie Mae Peluso. All those tickets will be available at jessiemaycom forward slash tour. Come check me out. Let's have some fun, baby. Come see me live. It's going to be a great time. And if by chance you're in LA tomorrow, October 26th, I'm bringing my new show, Hilarious, the Halloween edition to Jam in the Van. Go to my Instagram page. You can get tickets. We've got Crystal Marie. We've got Jeff Leach. We've got my boy, Jamie Kennedy, Doug Benson, and the one, the only Damon Wayans. Hello. It's a stack show. Closing it all out with my favorite girl, Kalia McNeil. It's going to be a banger. So come check us out. That's Jam in the Van in L.A., October 26th, hilarious Halloween edition. What else you got to do? You can't miss that show. You do not want to miss that show. It's going to be so much fun. Well, I hope you enjoy this week's episode of one of my favorite segments we've created from the Sharp Tongue Podcast. Truly enjoy it. Can't wait to look forward to more of your questions, comments, and advice that you need some help with. But I hope you enjoy this week's episode. (laughs) of Dr. Peluso. Fucking dogs. They couldn't wait two minutes. Sharp Tongue Podcast. Beep, 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 beep. You're listening to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse May Jessie Peluso. Peluso. It's a personal... Look, well, it's not really a look because it's a podcast. I'm already fucking this up. This is kind of like a verbal comedy diary, a deep look into the crevices of my mind. It's gonna get dirty. You might cry. You probably laugh. Hopefully, you'll laugh. The whole point is for you to laugh, but you also might cry. I talk about my family. I talk about farts. farts. I talk about love, loss, comedy, how hard it is to make it in this biz. I'm a fucking professional. Each week, it's something different. Sometimes I have a guest host. Sometimes it's gonna be a movie companion episode. Sometimes I just ramble about the bullshit I dealt with the week before. You never know what you're going to get. It's raw, uncut, and funny. It's me. Hello, everybody. Dr. Peluso in the house. I have my stethoscope, so you know I'm legit. And I also have my jar of psilocybin, so you really know I'm legit. Who else do you need advice from? I have the equipment and the medicine. 
hit up Dr. Peluso today. I am so excited about today's episode. I am pumped to give away some advice. And I should say this every single time, even though we reiterate it. I'm not a real doctor. I have no degree in medicine. I am solely giving you advice based on my life's experience and the books I've read, the podcasts I've listened to, and the various forms of entertainment and education I've consumed that has helped me in my life. So I am in by no way a replacement for whatever medical history you have or whatever medical plans you have with your doctor. So if some shit goes awry, I'm not the one to blame as I pop psilocybin into my mouth. You feel me? God, that's a real big cap. I don't know if I could handle that one. This one looks just right. Still kind of big. It's a Monday morning, you know? <laughs> the, allegedly, we're doing this, okay? This will probably get defunded on YouTube. Uh, let's see. There we go. Here's a good guy. Does he have a cap? Jeepers creepers. I'll get blasted to outer space. Where is there like a respectful... There we go. Respectful size... Monday medicine right there. Look at that guy. Okay. Mommy's got her medicine. Now we're just about ready. God, it's like chewing on a tree ship. Mm. Oh God, once it hits your lips. Delicious. I should let you guys know if you listen to the podcast, you know. I am on my 24th day of sobriety <laughs> after I pop a shroom. <laughs> LA sober. What does that mean? We don't, we don't drink alcohol. That's what it means. I am sober from alcohol for 24 days and can't say that, uh, I'm really reaping any benefits here. Gotta be honest, you know, uh, 24 days of sobriety and I don't have much to show for it, okay? I don't see an improvement worthy of this torture. That's what I have to say. Other than a stable mood, extreme clarity, and 100% memory recall, I don't see much improvement. <laughs> Has it been hard? Yes. This is the first time since I started drinking when I was 16 that I have gone this long without having a drop of alcohol. And I wasn't struggling with it. It wasn't ever, well, I shouldn't say that in my twenties, I definitely consumed and over consumed. I was a bartender and partook, served, overserved in all of the debauchery. But as an adult, I, I, I don't have an issue with it. I just wanted to see if I could do without it and also see where I was normally going for it physically going for a drink and why I was going for a drink. I do think that there is um, definitely a ritualistic approach to drinking. There are obviously historical rituals surrounding alcohol throughout a lot of different cultures. Obviously, the American culture overindulges, or at least we've been told we do. I mean, go to Europe. They're, they're pounding them back. Hello, have you heard of Ireland? They have Guinness at breakfast. So I don't know why they're slinging shots at the Americans. Oh, we're just the easy punching bag? Yeah, well, the rest of the world is fucking drunk too, okay? Maybe we're a little bit more obnoxious. I'll take that. But I don't think we're any more drunk. And I could be wrong. Again, like I said in the beginning of this, I was I am not a doctor. I'm also not scientist. <laughs> I'm drinking amino acid. Okay. This is, this is what, what my life has come to shrooms and amino acids, which are vital, vital, the building blocks of, of your muscles and, and essentially the product of protein. So get your amino acids. It's probably way too late in the day for me to be having these, but whatever. I, there's so much conflicting information that just breathe. Breathing is the only thing you can do that is 100% positive. Everything else is on is on the fence. We don't know. But the the positive effects of not drinking are very much apparent. And it's because of my parents that I drink. <laughs> They're both dead. I don't know if you heard. Uh hot topic. And 
I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to commit to something that was for me. I wanted to commit to something that was going to be very hard and commit to something that is in alignment with the current journey I'm on, which is a journey of self health and self love and a journey of personal evolution. And, um, I'm shedding all of the skin of my trauma and all of the skin of my past. And I can feel it happening. I don't know if anyone else out there is going through a similar transformation. I am an extremely transformative, transformative time and it's challenging. And I find I thrive under pressure. So I just decided to put a little bit more pressure on myself and remove something that I think essentially was creating more pressure in my life. And then I'm interested to see how I reconnect with it. I'm planning on not having a drip of alcohol until, until I do my next scan with Dr. Daniel Amon, which he was a guest on this podcast. If you don't know who he is, you should definitely check him out. He is a psychiatrist, multinational bestselling author. Um, he's been on multiple podcasts. He and I have had a couple, uh, opportunities to, to chat on this podcast and he's really changed my life. There's been a lot of things and people and experiences that have changed my life, but he will go down in, in my history book as somebody who has really helped me identify areas where I was struggling and give a name to it. And also, help me take some accountability for where I have and how I have contributed to my own demise and the habits that I have had since I was a little girl and how they, they have affected and have disrupted my process and my ability to focus and, and you know, my other issues with various things, commitments, focus and, you know, just general continuity in my life have been a struggle. And now I know why. And, and I've been on this journey and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am without the information and resources that Dr. Daniel Amon has bestowed upon me. So I'll be eternally grateful for him, but you should definitely check him out. I think we're going to have him on the podcast again as well. We will be filming my rebrain scan, my brain rescan, however you want to I uh, call it, and it's a spec scan, single photon emuted, emitted computed tom topography. It's a mouthful. It's called SPECT. I had one done last year. So I'm interested to see on the other side of admitting I had depression, on the other side of this short stint of sobriety, I'm interested to see how my brain has evolved. And I hope, <laughs> I hope <laughs> it's an evolution and not devolution. I don't know if that's a word. We should look it up. Devol devolution. I feel like it should be. It rolled off the tongue nicely. Sometimes I say these words and they're in my head and I don't know where they come from. Uh, yeah, devolution. Look at that. I'm probably saying it long. Saying it long. Wrong. The process of declining from a higher to a lower level of effective power. Let's hope that's not my fucking brain. So I am excited to see where my brain is at. But this is not about me. This is about you guys, this episode. This is a Dr. Peluso episode. And if you are interested in seeing how you could submit to have your questions, comments, and concerns addressed on this episode, you can shoot them over at my Instagram, usually Sundays to Mondays. It's not every single week. So you got to just tune in and see on my Instagram page when we post those up. Uh, this week we have one, we had one up this morning. So we have a couple questions to get to. Wow. A, a bunch are there already. You go to my Instagram story Sundays to Mondays and you can type in your question. Also, you can email us jessiemaypelusocomedy at gmail.com to send your messages that way. And without further ado, let's get in on some of these questions here. Dykema underscore. Dykema underscore underscore. Why are wake up farts so glorious? Oh, man, it's, it's like your asshole's first breath of the day. That's what it feels like. It feels like your butt going... Ugh, like that morning stretch right out of your ass. But I will say is the person who does fart Fridays, I don't like to fart in front of 
people I'm intimate with. My friends, burr, 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 you're getting it every which way. I might even I might even toss you a queef. If you get a queef from me, consider yourself loved. Consider yourself in my inner circle. <laughs> But I think wake up farts, it feels like the first breath of the day. You know, it's a way to start the day from the ass up. It's a way to let the world know you're alive from the ass up. I don't think anything bad ever happens from the ass up. Well, according to the new series of American Horror Story, that apparently is not a true statement. Wake up farts are glorious. And I love that you said glorious. It's a great word to describe that experience. And if you guys have any fart submissions you'd like for me to post on my Instagram page on Fridays for Fart Fridays, send them to us, DM them to us or email them to us. And Deb will have a great time posting those. <laughs> um, Shaman Don Art Fails. Is chasing a shot with a mixed drink good for you? Well, this is a timely question considering my sober journey right now. I will say that I am looking forward to listening to the Dr. Huberman at labs episode of what the effects are on the brain from alcohol and marijuana. Dr. Daniel Amon sent me the link. I'm interested to see. I have not watched it yet. So that'll be something that I consume today. But we do know that it's not good. And it's one of those things that maybe we shouldn't know. Ignorance truly is bliss in a lot of situations, but ignorance is only bliss depending on what your intention is. If your intention is brain health, then you should have some information. And I think we can pretty much agree unanimously that alcohol really isn't worth the squeeze, right? We can say the juice really isn't worth the squeeze with alcohol. But then again, you look at countries, places around the world where there are these blue zones where people live over 100 and they're consuming alcohol, not on a belligerent scale. They're not over consuming. They're not getting wasted and streaking through the quad. They're having a glass of Bordeaux with, you know, Cacio de Pepe. Like they're not they're, they're not blasting shots in mixed drinks at noon at a flea market which sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> sounds like a fucking great day. Why are all the most blissful moments so toxic for us? But chasing a shot, look, if you're having a mixed drink, you might as well chase a shot with it, you know? Go go ham or go home is, is what I say. But we know it's not good for us. And that's why I'm on my sober journey. That's why Dr. Daniel Amon sending me links of podcasts and the content being that of education as to what happens to your brain when you consume marijuana and alcohol. So no shaman dot art fails chasing a shot with a mixed drink unfortunately is not good for you. But science shows that psilocybin has some really beneficial effects on the brain in creating new neural pathways and also helping a lot of people recover from alcoholism and addiction. But I think we'll see that in the near future uh, being a real part of our industry and the landscape of conversation involving healing and the brain. And I know that Dr. Daniel Amon is open to the idea of that, which is very exciting. So I hope you find some alternative vices that are aligned with your your life's intentions. Adam Adamp, Adamp or Adam P. <laughs> Leave it up to me to read that as a damp. A damp 83. Let me tell you, 1983 was really damp for a lot of us. Divorced a year, started dating again. How do people do this? Oh, from your lips to God's ears, a damp. Listen, you have an opportunity to start anew. And I will say I think you might be ready to start dating, but I don't know you. I will say don't start dating again until you've done some new work on yourself. What do I mean by new work? 
I mean implementing something new into your life that is solely for the sake of healing, not for indulgence, not for satiation, not for gratification, nothing, no, no more of these short term gratifying experiences or indulgences that don't have any real positive effects on us. They're just giving us these short term rewards and they don't really reap any sort of beneficial effect on our life. So you're not ready to start dating until you've started to implement some healthier habits for yourself. First and foremost, ask yourself how you occurred in that relationship and how you would have done something differently. Not in a regretful manner. I don't regret anything I've ever done. I think regret and guilt are these wasted emotions that weigh us down from really healing and evolving. I also think they're roadblocks in transformation. Maybe a little bit of regret and a little bit of guilt can teach us something, but wallowing in those emotions only keep us there. They are not a progressive state of being and we want to stay in a progressive state of being so we can evolve, right? And we can learn from what we did and what, what went wrong. And one of the hardest things to ask ourselves is what did I do wrong? And very rarely do we ask ourselves, how did I occur in this situation? A lot of us don't even realize how we occur when we're out in the world and talking and having experiences. We don't even realize who we are until somebody else shows us. And sometimes that can be a real wake up call. And I think divorce is an opportunity for two people who tried to make something very intimate work and failed at it, have a real moment with one another and be completely honest because what do you have to lose? You've already admitted it's failed and us as a society and as a, as a people have acknowledged that failures are the fabric of success. So what can we learn from the failures of our divorce that can lead to the success of our next relationships? It might not be with this person that we became divorced from and that's fine. People are there for a season, a reason, or a lesson, or a blessing. And you have to realize and recognize what category those people fall into. And there's a reason for your divorce. There obviously was a season for this individual in your life. And you can learn a lesson. And from that, you will get a blessing. And I think that's a way to approach most challenging scenarios. And for your divorce, how did you occur? Because you don't want to reoccur that way in your next scenario. And so often we live life on autopilot. And unfortunately, the person flying the plane is the person who is still living in the trauma of their childhood or living in the trauma of a place where they don't feel like they're worthy or don't feel like they're good enough or don't feel like they're worth love or don't love themselves. Most autopilot is flown by a toxic person living in a toxic place. And that's how we kind of function in our own lives. We're just on autopilot. We don't even realize the decisions are made that we make have already been made for us by our trauma. We're in such a, a cycle of self-inflicted toxicity and we're accepting of it. We've become numb to the toxicity that we're causing ourselves. So divorce is a great place to ask yourself, how have you been toxic? And it's a fucking tough question, a eh, damp. It's a tough question to ask yourself. I've had to ask myself that. I know I've been toxic by being distant and by being, uh, not being vulnerable enough with people, you know, my, my intimate relationships my boyfriends and my family members by being in my youth. I was a total people pleaser because I grew up in a pretty argumentative household. So I became the person that was the calming energy, which for an eight year old is not appropriate. An eight year old's journey should be joyful and learning, not managing the emotions of adults. So I think a damp, you have to ask yourself how you've occurred in a toxic way and why, and then you can start dating. <laughs>
that's how people do this. You know what? That's people don't do it that way. And that's why we're all flailing about on the dating scene, attempting to make it work at love when we haven't worked on loving ourselves. And I say this a lot to people who send me emails or messages. You've, you've got time now and the time should be spent on yourself, not getting back out there. I think getting back out there, and I may have said this in the past, I think it's terrible advice. If I've said it, I think I was wrong. Maybe a version of it is okay. As long as you're in alignment with what you're trying to accomplish, and I think we should all be trying to accomplish some form of self-healing because there's only liberation on the other side of that. Otherwise, we're just cyclical with our toxicity, and we don't want to do that. So, Adamp, I wish you well. Also, try psilocybin. Will... 0206. How do I talk to women if I suffer from social anxiety? Wow. I love the men coming forward on Sharp Tongue Podcast, Dr. P episodes with these very vulnerable questions because it's a sign that you really want to, first of all, get some help. And I appreciate that you're coming to a fake doctor for it. And it's also a sign that you're willing to be vulnerable. And that's a first step in evolution, brother. Besides awareness is a willingness to be vulnerable. How do you talk to women? <laughs> How do you talk to women who are Wiccans with a wiffle ball? <laughs> How do I talk to women if I suffer from social anxiety? It's a really good question. You know, I would practice talking to people in general. Growing up, my dad and my mother were both very social people. My sister is the most social person I know in Syracuse. Every time we go someplace someone knows her. My sister makes friends with every single person who touches her from the lady who does her pedicures to her dentist. I mean, she knows personal details about these people. And I told my sister, if she wanted a career as a mayor. She would win hands down, probably like a 90 percentile uh, voting would, would, would be what her success would be with her campaign. 90% of people would vote for her in that fucking town. Cause that's how much of the town she knows. And I'm a similar person. I am a little bit more reserved only because I'm trying to conserve my energy so I'm able to be present when I'm performing on a podcast or on stage or on a TV show or a movie. I need to be able to have this energy reserve. But my sister, a majority of her energy besides her children and her family go towards communicating with people and building and forging these amazing, remarkably in-depth relationships and it comes from talking to everybody. And I think you circumnavigate going right to a woman and practicing with women by practicing on everyone. Because then there's not so much pressure put on you communicating with a woman. Right. I feel like if you make it very specific, it's a little bit more challenging. Not that it's impossible, but for myself... I think a better approach would to would to be to make it a little bit more general and a little bit more broad. Get it broad because you're essentially trying to talk to them. Oh, don't call them broads. It's not right. You're not a feminist. I I think practice talking to everybody. My dad and mom would talk to every single person. My mother was a union rep. My father was a, a day drinker, and they really made it work. <laughs> Oh, I just got a whiff of my mom. You ever had anybody uh, with dead parents or anybody dead in your life? I've had this experience lately and it's been happening on a reoccurring scale of my mother's scent circulating through my, my aura. And it's really interesting. It's happened a lot more in the past week than it has this entire time. This isn't a grief survival guide episode, but I had to acknowledge that I just got a whiff of her. I'm losing my fucking stethoscope. I'm all flustered. Mom, are you here? Um, I will take that sign received. I love you too. Thank you for being here with me. Um, I'm talking about how much you talk and both of my parents, my dad would talk to everyone. So I grew up learning the, the gift of the gab really and learning how to communicate with people and learning how to read people and how to make people feel comfortable and seen. That's what my parents did. 
I witnessed it from a very young age. They loved to communicate with people. They loved people. That was their magic. And, and I think if you just start to talk to the most basic people, not only will, will you begin to build your communication skills and diminish that anxiety surrounding public speaking and social anxiety, which is totally normal, by the way, a majority of people would say that they have social anxiety. One of the biggest fears people have is public speaking. So you are not alone. You're not weird. You are common. And maybe that would alleviate some of your insecurity, if any, that you're experiencing surrounding this experience that you're having. Totally normal. You will, you know, be able to practice your speaking ability and you'll also be making people's day. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a scenario, especially in this new world post COVID where when you order food, a lot of the times the waiter is in erased aspect of the experience. There's no waiter. You go up to the register, you get a number and you know, that's it. So a lot of the times they'll ask your name for the order or you'll be in different scenarios where you're purchasing something and somebody has to ask your name. And it's always a one way transaction, which I think is bizarre for someone to take my money for me to purchase something from someone and they take my name and I don't have theirs. And so every time this happens, they'll say, can I get a name for the order? Or they'll say, can I get it your name? And I'll say, Jesse. And then I'll say, what's your name? 9.9 times out of 10, they're shocked that I even asked them. And a, a high number as well of, of them are smiling and happy. And just for a second where somebody's acknowledging them, most of the reason people act out or up or off are because they want to, is because they want to be acknowledged, acknowledged. These people want to feel like they're a part of something or want to just feel like they're considered. And so you're going to be building your social skills and also making someone's day by communicating with people from the person at the gas station to the receptionist at your dentist office, the guy who's flashing you from across the street. Everyone needs a hello because we're all struggling. (laughs) So we'll know that you can get over this practice doesn't make perfect, but it does create an intention. So keep practicing talking to people and then mix some women in there. And the best way to go about it is to ask questions, ask questions about people and wish them a good day and, and, you know, find a common ground. If you see something that they have that reminds you of something that you enjoy or whatever, you may have to acknowledge personal space and, you know, also read social cues, which can be hard sometimes, but short, sweet, and simple should help you along your path of trying to build this social skill and this social muscle. And I wish you the best. Let me know how it goes. Well, I think you're going to nail it. Let's see what else we got here today. Um, Ben Marcus, what is your favorite scent on a man? Should that scent be smelled or discovered? Wow. Um, what's my favorite scent on a man? There's this smell in LA. (laughs) It's homeless. That's my favorite scent on a man. No, there's this smell, uh, that men exude in LA, this, this odor that they, they all smell the same and it smells amazing. And it sort of started with Combes de Garçon. I think that's the name of the cologne. Combes de Garçon. It is... (laughs) (laughs) Apparently I'm allergic to it. It smells so damn good. I'm sneezing. That is hilarious. It's it. This scent called Combe de Garçon was a smell and a a cologne that I loved. And every person I ask is wearing that cologne, but now there's like an evolution of it and I can't think of what it is, but I will tell you it smells, it smells like, (sighs) I don't even know, like day three of Burning Man. And I've never been to it. I'm going to go next year, but I've never been to Burning Man. This is what the scent is. It's day three of Burning Man. 
and it's like this earthy, semi-musky, a touch of sweetness, just a like a chef's kiss of sweetness, but it's mainly an earthy smell. And I'll tell you, that'll make me undo a button or two. I don't know what to call it. I will find the scent. I will find it. I am on a journey of figuring out where the fuck the OG is because they all smell the same out here. And it's very confusing. It's very confusing when like a guy you have a crush on smells the same as the cashier at the, at the grocery store. It starts to really mess with the woman. So I think we need to have a caste system for smells. I think we got to, people got to stay in their lane. (laughs) Okay. Uh, A fortune 500 individual cannot smell the same as someone bagging groceries. I'm sorry. I was going to say groceries. This is, it's not okay. In my mind, we really got to start creating some sort of hierarchy in the cologne world so that I stop being confused. Um, let's see. What other questions do we have here? Ed, Ed Race? Ed Race? Ah, that's an interesting name. What do you do for your peach? Shave, wax, epilator, etc. Need help? You know, I've really kind of just let the peach do what it do lately. I do a little, you know, womanscaping to keep it not looking like an unruly patch of shrubbery around an unkempt house. You know, like the house on the block that hasn't sold. It's been on the market for 20 years and no one's trimmed a shrub in the same amount of time. I don't like my peach to look like that. I don't like my peach to look like a bush of a haunted house. (laughs) I do not like my peach to look like a bush in front of a haunted house. So I try to keep it cute. Except for the Halloween season, I'll, I'll let it go just to keep it, you know, spooky. (laughs) But (coughs) I'm so sorry, guys. So sorry. I'm making myself choke. Mm. I used to shave. I used to shave shapes into this shit. I used to shave like a landing strip. I don't know. I thought I was JFK for a hot minute. I used to shave shapes, arrows, like they don't know which way to go. But the arrow, I'd, I'd fuck them up sometimes. I'd make the arrow go left or right and really confuse them. Like my vagina's on either side of my hip. <laughs> <It's> stupid. <laughs> make an arrow go back around. Like it's around the back. And then I'd keep the hair above my ass and point that down. So it really was just showing them to walk down the hall to find my asshole. But, and I'm not doing anything. I am, I'm abstinent for a year. So I'm going to let this shit just bloom. I'm really going to get to my roots. Literally just going to see what my hair roots are. So Godspeed girl or boy, whoever this is, Adres, Adras, Idrisi. It it could be, it could be like, I don't know, a couple letters and then your last name's race. I'm not sure, but good luck on your, on your coochie hair journey. The Ace 97. I love you. I love you too. Thank you for showing some love. We appreciate it. We love to see it. And I hope that you find love. I hope you love yourself. Okay. Uh, Let's see what else we got going on. Diffuse. Male drive. I don't have any gusto. How can I get my tea? Um, Mrs. Doctor. (laughs) So I'm assuming you're talking to your libido. And again, I'm not a real doctor. I've only read some things. First thing I would test if you're having a low libido and also know this is a very common occurrence. Most of my male friends have expressed having low libido and it kind of happens around the forties. It seems. And the first thing I would get tested is your testosterone levels and see if you're having a hormonal imbalance because so many factors can cause hormonal imbalances. I know from a personal experience, stress is one of the biggest factors in throwing your hormones off besides what you're eating and your environmental factors as well. Check your testosterone levels and and check your stress levels. Sometimes, you know, we, I, we've spoke about this in other podcasts, we function at such a stressful level that that becomes our base. And then because this 
stressful level is our homeostatic way of being, we've almost numbed the effects that stress has in our body. Apparently, even though that stress is causing something underneath the apparent effects of stress, we are numbed to so that we can function at this level without feeling stressed. Does that make sense? So it's almost like we have had this psychosomatic effect of a lack of stress so that we can function through the stress. And that's when stress really starts to infiltrate your body on a cellular level that, that, that real stress takes a hold and causes inflammation. It causes all sorts of issue, issues with your body and issues that we can't really see and sometimes can't feel because we are surviving at this level. It's, it's amazing what levels of stress we're able to work through and not even acknowledge the, the detriment it's having on our body. Case in point, it's exactly what happened to my mom and her whole body ended up, you know, all, all of her systems were failing by the end, but I don't want this to happen to you. We're talking about low libido. I'm only saying the factors that I have read and have experienced being the cause of this hormonal imbalance. Stress is one of them. Also your lifestyle. What are you doing on a day to day? I, I read something recently that I started to do and it's time journaling. And it's not something you need to do forever. It's only a chunk of time for you to start journaling what you're doing throughout the day. Like I, first thing I do, I wake up in the morning, I meditate. And then for like an hour, I'm reading, doing crosswords, kind of slowly waking up my brain. So you start to like really document from eight to nine, I'm eating breakfast and you know, making the kids lunch and from nine to 10, da, 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 the whole list of the day needs to go down. So you can really take into account where you're spending your energy and what your energy expenditure really is looking like. Are there any parts in the day, even just five minutes where you're releasing this energy instead of storing it? Most of our function throughout the day is us storing energy and us like absorbing the stress of what we're doing. I got to make the kids lunch and I got to drive them to school or I got to get to work. Like we're just taking in a lot. Very small parts of our day are spent expelling energy. So I think start to take a time journal for yourself and see what your lifestyle really looks like. Also with low libido, what's your depression experience like? Are you experiencing depression? Do you feel low energy? Are you feeling like you don't want to be social? Are you feeling antisocial? Th these are real questions you're going to want to ask yourself to understand sort of where the source of your low libido is coming from. Again, very common. A lot of people go through this and, and a lot of females go through this too. I experience this as well. Also, are you on any medications? You might want to look at some of the side effects of your medication. And also, do you have like chronic illness? Chronic illness can cause a hormone influction. Um, and th those stress factors really are important. And also, are you sleeping? Sleep is one of the most important aspects of health that we really are starting to put an onus on. You know, there's books and studies and, and whole college courses devoted to the effects of sleep and the quality of sleep. So I would look at your stress levels, your lifestyle, your sleep habits, your depression, and you know, if you're taking any medication or if you have any chronic illness, maybe you're, there's an underlying issue medically you're not even aware of. A lot of the times our body sends out these Paul Revere experiences, what I call it. There actually is a Paul Revere um, effect that is sent out in our body when something is going wrong to alert the rest of the systems. But the symptoms that come about, I have a theory, I think are a Paul reveal revere of sorts where the symptom is just an effect of what is really the underlying cause of everything. And I think, you know, if you're experiencing low libido, there's something else going on and it could be an easy switch or maybe, you, you know, uh, something a little bit more in depth, but I hope these help you. I'll write them down in the show notes with uh, a link for resources for you and know that it's a common situation and you can get through this shit brother you're not alone you're not alone and i wish you the best mr diffuse i hope you diffuse 
that low libido and get out there with a hog and start poking bitches consensually. Um, Tim Fresh one, can dogs heal or nah? Heck yeah, dogs can heal. What are you talking about? Brother, you know this. You know this, man. Why do you think I have three? I need a lot of healing. I need a lot of healing. Uh, Dogs are great for so many things. First of all, I have full conversations with my dogs. They're basically therapists. They didn't ask for it, but they're going to get it. And people who are like, we don't deserve dogs. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we brought them into a warm home. Okay? We deserve dogs. They're so lucky. They don't have to forage out in the wilderness and be in some shitty pack of wolves anymore. They don't have to, like, deal with the alpha wolf. Like, oh, fuck, here's Sven. Oh, Sven, he's been the alpha for so long. I look at him up on the peak of the mountain, puffing his chest and howling. And all the ladies love Sven. Like, fuck Sven. Right now, Sven is at home on a... A hundred thousand thread count Egyptian cotton bed for himself. Sven's a bitch right now. Okay. So dogs can literally bow down because you're welcome for the, for the shelter and for the consistent meals. (laughs) You're fucking welcome. We got you out of the wilderness. Okay. You started from the bottom and now you're here. You're welcome. We do deserve dogs, but dogs are amazing. They're therapists. They also can create a really great start uh, in a peg of creating healthy habits because you have to walk them a few times a day and they help you create a regimen around that. And then they also are helping you get exercise. I think on average people live six to 10 years longer if they have pets, dogs specifically because of that, those two things, you have to walk them three times a day and you're also walking three times a day. It's exercise. So you're able to talk to them. You talk to them on the walk. Also, the snuggles are epic. Are you kidding me? I love a dog snuggle. So you're getting communication. You're getting exercise. You're getting touch, which is a vital aspect of emotional health. I mean, there are studies that show differences between babies that are held immediately by their mothers and those that aren't. As far as like their immune function and their immune capabilities and having you know, immunocompromised diseases down the road or a weaker immune system, literally touch heals you. And it's one of the first things we need coming into this world. So dogs offer that. And also they teach you to be selfless because you have to consider something else. You have to care for something else. And sometimes we care too much. It's like, okay, calm down. Essentially it is just an animal. I get that Mr. Peepers is your world. You might want to expand your world a little. If your dog is your world, your world is too small. And I know people are going to come for me, but let's just keep it real. And I have three. Okay. I, (laughs) I have three dogs. So don't be like, you don't get it, bitch. I get it. They're all the greatest dogs in the world. All of three of my dogs are better than all of anyone else's dogs. So I don't want to hear it and don't come for me. But also if your dogs are your world, you need to make your world bigger. And I'm speaking to myself. Not to mention the magnitude of jobs that dogs have that really help people. Dogs help people, victims of war, people who are paraplegic, people who are in wheelchairs, and people with autism, children with autism, people with cancer, PTSD. Dogs are there by our sides, both sides, front, back, and middle. They're there helping us walk. They're there helping us make sure that we feel comfort through our seizures. They're there helping us over a curb, helping us cross a street because we can't see. They are such amazing creatures that we trained. (laughs) So it's a cohesive relationship. Really, I'm saying humans are amazing. We just always want to act like something else is so much better. Well, how did it get that way? We have to start taking credit for these amazing gifts that we've created and these animals, the the way that we've trained dogs to really accommodate and be sometimes the greatest accoutrement to our life is because of humans. It's because of human beings, but they're, they really are healing. They're so amazing. I also think they play dumb. They placate to us as well. And, you know, you always see those videos of like when dogs don't know that we're watching and they're like 
you know, in the kitchen dicing up scallions. And you're like, how do you have that dexterity, Baxter? How are you able to slice up a fucking pineapple? I don't even know how to do that. I swear, if you leave a dog alone, he he's speaking in French on your couch, smoking a cigarette, <laughs> looking, reading the New York Times. <laughs> But then they play dumb for us because we're like, oh my God, you're so cute, you little baby. If you don't talk to your dog like that, you should not have a dog. Okay? baby. Ooh. I read this um, article about why people baby talk with their dogs. And it said that basically we feel like we can be ourselves because dogs don't judge us. How do we know they don't judge us? Do you speak dog? Uh... I've seen judgment in Chaplin's eyes. I've seen judgment in that little fucker's eyes. Okay. And I don't appreciate it. Okay. I'm not going to skip a meal, but I will threaten you and you better stop judging me. But it was an interesting article saying that we do let ourselves be completely vulnerable with our pets because we feel like we can be ourselves and we should practice that more with human beings because essentially we all just want love especially, you know, people who have pets. Why do we have pets? Because we want to be vulnerable and we want to have some love. So extend that out to human beings. That's going to be my challenge for you. I have to start doing these weekly challenges with you. My challenge for you this week is to be more vulnerable with a human in your life. And you can do that by giving a compliment. You can do that by um, offering to help with something. You could do that by expressing yourself in a way that you never had before. You could do that by, by having a constructive conflict, which is something my cousin mentioned to me. I had a, a meeting and there was constructive conflict and, and that was a way for me to be vulnerable and overcome something challenging. So that's my challenge to you is to be more vulnerable with a human being in your life. Practice on your dog. <laughs> hey, Will, you can practice talking to women with a dog. And if you don't have a dog, what a great reason to adopt a dog. But don't like inundate the dog with your, you know, your chat. You got to get it out in the world. But that's my challenge to you guys this week. Go out there and be more vulnerable with somebody else. Um, before we get out of here, we have a couple emails for Dr. P. This guy writes in, he says, hi, Jesse May, daddy DM here. I do love you. But after the recent separation from my life, my wife, I'm also protecting my pussy energy. <laughs> is this is a guy. This is a guy writing this. It's so funny. Coming out of the back end of a relationship as a dad and in a new city where most of the people I knew were her friends. Do you have any advice for somebody exploring a new version of themselves and seeking fellowship besides mushrooms? Fair and heard. Well, kind of revert to what, I expressed to our previous gentleman who is divorced and wants to get out there and start dating again. It's basically, yeah, I think a damp. Yeah, we're talking about a damp. He was divorced a year and started dating again. You know, I'm going to say the same thing to you. If you're in a new city and most of the friends were hers, it's a great time for you to pick up some fucking hobbies. And I will say men are usually really great about their hobbies. Sometimes they have too much. They're spelunking, they're cycling, they're rocket, they're rock climbing, they're they're motor biking on the edge of mountains. It's all their hobbies are things that almost murder them. Which makes me want them to also seek some psychiatric help, but I also respect I respect the the challenge pick up a couple hobbies that you've never done. And it, you know what? Something that you think you wouldn't enjoy. So you should start a hobby that is the last thing you want to do and commit to doing it. Do just do one, one hobby that is the last thing you want to do. And I guarantee you'll find some benefit from it. If you go in with an open mindset, if you go in with an open mindset, remember we talked before about people in your life and experiences in your life being there for a season, a reason, a blessing, or a lesson. You will be able to find one of those out of an experience if you keep your mind open to it. And usually the blessing is revealed after all of those experiences if your mind is open to it. So that's my advice to you is if you're coming out of a relationship, you're a father, also a great opportunity for you to bond I know a lot of parents are like, the last thing I want to do is play with my kids. There are a handful of parents out there that get on their hands and knees and love to play with their children. 
if you're the former, I will say edibles and psilocybin can help you clear away the congestion that deters you from accessing your inner child. Mushrooms, psilocybin, and marijuana can really help you access your inner child so that you get down on your hands and knees and play with your children. I've seen it firsthand with my sister. I've seen it firsthand with a lot of adults. So I will say, even though you said besides mushrooms, if this is a place for you to be able to bond with your kids and you aren't the type of parent that enjoys playing, which is totally fucking fine, by the way, I realize I'm the stoned aunt and I don't have any children, but I'm a human being. It's totally fucking fine if you don't want to play with your children, but know that that I think comes at a cost down the road because kids need to play. It's how they learn. So I will say if you're struggling playing with them, maybe find a conduit and sometimes, you know, a little microdose of, uh, psilocybin or mar- marijuana can really help you get into that state of mind. And the other thing I'm going to say is that you have an opportunity to learn some new skills and to make some new friends, your own friends. And the only way to do that is to get yourself out there. You can't sit at home all day and expect to build a life. I'm sorry, you can't. And it's really lazy and it's a way to keep yourself in a, in a state of being. And that being is not wanting to evolve. If you're just staying at home and you're not doing anything different, well, then nothing's going to change. So you got to get out there. You really have to put yourself out there, but you have to do it for you. You know, you need to pick up these hobbies for you and make it be a goal and intention to learn more about yourself and to challenge yourself. It can't, I really think putting dating as the goal is a total opposite experience that you want to have. I think you should get dating out of your mind. And I think you should really look and set out to challenge yourself and do something that's going to make you feel uncomfortable. Take a sewing course, take a crocheting course. It could be something so stupid. Just do something, something for yourself. And you know, if you also want to combine it and have it be an opportunity to bond with your children, take a little microdose of mushrooms and get down on those hands and knees and and build a sandcastle. Even if you don't have any sand, you know, crazier things have been done. And I think you just need a little bit of imagination and a commitment and a clear intention of what you're trying to get out of this. And it sounds like you already have that because of how you phrased and worded your, your statement. You said, do you have any advice for someone exploring a new version of themselves. Very self-aware, very evolved way of asking a question and seeking fellowship. The only way I think, not the only way, one of the best ways to build fellowship and to explore a new version of yourself is to join a group and to challenge yourself. You can't just sit at home and expect to build a fellowship. Not that that's what you're doing, but a lot of people do this. So I wish you the best. And let me know, please let me know. You guys have to follow up with me, Jesse May Peluso comedy at Gmail. Let me know how everything went for you. I want to hear how you were vulnerable and make sure that I, I can share this on the podcast. I won't say your name, but please share with me how this helped and, and also how this episode helped. I would love to hear from you guys. So DM me on Instagram or send me an email and I appreciate you so much. Don't forget to come see me live. I've got a few dates left. I know we talked about it at the beginning of the podcast, but new year's Eve in Syracuse at the funny bone, I'm going to be at comedy in the Carlson December 15th and 16th. That's in Rochester, New York. And I'm away every weekend in November. So this weekend I'm going to be in Pottsville or Pottstown, Pennsylvania. The town has changed a couple times. It's Soul Joel's with Carly Aquilino. That's October 28th and 29th. November 3rd, 4th and 5th, I'm going to be at the House of Comedy in Arizona. November 11th and 12th, I'll be at the Cisco Brewery in New Hampshire. November 18th and 19th, I'll be in Chicago at Zany's. And November 25th and 26th, I'll be at the Albany Funny Bone. All those places are available on my website, jessiemay.com forward slash tour. Thank you guys so much for listening. And I look forward to hearing how this has helped you evolve. Keep going. Keep trucking. And um, yeah, I love you guys. Thank you so much.